everyone, we are Banshee UAV Robotics or Battery and Integrated Structures High Endurance Experimental UAV Robotics. I am the ECE lead, um, Maggie Hong. And I'm the Robotics of Team Lead, Josh Perol. And our faculty advisors at Cal Poly Pomona are Professor Stephen Dobbs and Dr. Jenny Zen Yu. UAVs like this drone over here have an average flight time of about 30 minutes to an hour based on its payload size. Many commercial drones out, many commercial drones have a similar uh, problem where their size and their payload weight determine how long they fly, which is not really a long time. So we currently, uh, our solution to combat this flight, that short flight duration, is to enable, is to create, uh, so, sorry, is to create, uh, is to create replicable uh, stations that can, uh, that can help provide infinite flight times by autonomously changing the battery, uh, by uh, transferring data uh, to the cloud or other stations to view, and also to be able to be operable in, in remote locations. So how does our ground system work then? So this is our 3D model that we have designed, the ideal model. It has three main compartments. It has the ground control station with the drone landing autonomously onto, the battery transfer pod, which allows the battery to be transported from one station to the other, and our battery vending machine, which can store and recharge LiPo batteries on standby. So how does our robotic ground system work? First, the drone lands autonomously onto the ground station. Then it allows the battery, uh, the arm, to be pulled out, transferred to our battery vending machine, which then gets put into an open socket. It rotates accordingly, the ba uh, battery vending machine, and dispense a new fully charged battery. Then the arm will then pull it out, transfer it back to the ground station where the drone is, place it into the drone's chamber, and then take off. So our system not only supports our S500 quadcopters that you can see many of our drawings and pictures, but also our student-made cinch drone, which is the EVTOL designed by us in-house, as well as our commercial EVTOL over here called the Baby Shark, which uh, the Air Force Research Labs provided us. So this is our hypothetical long endurance flight mission for our drone. Let's say we start off somewhere in Los Angeles. The drone will then take little pit stops at our own station and then finish at New York. At this um, current state, this is basically impossible because LiPo batteries take two to four hours to charge up. But with our stations that take around five minutes turnover time, that will allow the drone to just land and then take off right away. So this is the first component of our ground system, our um, ground control station. It is a large seven by seven AR marker that the drone uh, computer uh, vision can scan and land autonomously onto. Once landed, the induction coil on the drone uh, connects with the induction coil on the ground control station, indicating that the drone is present on the station. As you can see, there are two modes of LED lights, the red meaning that it's being occupied by the drone, and the green indicating that any drone can land at the moment. What other purpose does the induction coil um, do? It also allows the drone to be hot swappable, meaning that if the whole battery is re completely removed from the drone, it allows 20 watts of power to charge and power up that whole system on the, uh, on the drone, such as the Raspberry Pi and the flight mission. If we didn't have this induction coil, the drone will basically be dead once the battery is removed because it's like turning off you know, the drone. So this also enables the drone to send its data, the mission data, to our ground station, which will eventually go to the virtual uh, cloud. This is our induction coil. Uh, as you can see in this figure right here, this is the induction coil on the ground station stick in the middle of our um, AR marker block. On this side, this is our transceiver coil on the drone, which is sending power, or which is receiving the power from the induction coil on the ground station. Uh, we need around 20 watts of power to keep the drone on, and through our data analysis, we can say that around 30 um, millimeter distance between the two induction coils can provide that amount of power. Another component of our system is the battery vending machine, which can house up to eight porous lipo batteries on standby for any drone that needs to get its battery replaced. Now this can be done using the NEMA 23 stepper motor that resides in the center hub. And so this, this motor will rotate the battery vending machine so that the 
battery can be rented out to a new, a new drone that requires a new battery, or the old battery can be, can be put back in to charge the old battery for another drone later on. Uh, one key component or features of the battery vending machine is actually the battery case, which has a mapping chamber in the back to allow for any connections of the battery to the router to the back, so that the, the mechanic arm can easily slide it in and contact the pins so that the battery can charge, as well as give the, the central computer the, the, the information about the, the four cells so that can bounce a charge, bounce charge the battery as well. Another component is the locking key pattern on the side of the case, which goes hand in hand with the solid locking mechanism of the battery chamber. This allows for the battery to be, when it, when it gets fully plugged into the battery chamber, it can get secure. It can, yeah, it can have a secure connection so that the battery won't uh, disconnect accidentally or due to any other factors that are, that are not supposed to be happening. So we took one of the chambers from the battery vending machine model and we're gonna demo to you guys the solenoid locking. Um, we usually have a circuit on here, but just to have everything safety purposes, we want to just do it by manually. So I'm gonna open and close the solenoid box to show you guys the locking mechanism. Uh, okay, I'll pick you. All right, so can you try to pull out the battery? You can't, right? So now we're gonna put it in unlock mode. It's gonna, right, it's gonna open both sides. Please pull it out. It can slide really easily. On the back, again, we have the mapping chambers which allows, usually there is um, copper cord, uh, copper in here, which will connect to the copper uh, ones in here. All right, now, uh, let's see. Can you please put this back inside? Unfortunately, you can't because it's in the lock mode, right? So I'm gonna open the solenoid circuits again. Please put it back in. Thank you. And it slides easily back inside if it would easily slide back inside. Uh, oh, there you go. There you go, and now it's locked in back inside the circuit, or the chamber, sorry. So, uh, also in the back of the chamber, we have this area right here in the back, which is this side, which will house a lot of our electronic circuits. Now, which circuits do, do we need? There are three main circuits. We have our locking circuit, our battery management circuit, as well as our battery charging circuits. So in this figure, 10.1, uh, we have the solenoid locking circuit. Earlier, you have seen the demo with manual open and closing by my hands, but we actually have a circuit. If you look closely, when the magnet gets close to the sensor, it opens and closes. There you go. Wow. Okay. <laughs> and, and that, opens and closes depending on the location of the chamber. We have um, in figure 10.2, the wireless BMS circuit, which stands for battery management system. And what this circuit does is it wirelessly transfer the four um, cell voltages on each LiPo battery and send it to our hub. The reason why we have a wireless um, connection using NR24 modules is that we want to reduce any uh, wiring entanglements when the battery vending machine is rotating. So putting these two very large circuits together, which definitely does not fit in this chamber, we have designed a PCB circuit. It is a double-sided circuit, uh, PCB, that will be housed inside this chamber. It is currently being fabricated as we speak, and let's move on. So how can we access all the data? Earlier I told you guys about the flight data from the ground control station and the battery vending machine data. With this website that we have designed, you can actually access the data on the website anywhere around the world. So you can see this is the battery voltage va uh, values as well as the flight data that's being sent from the ground, the drone to the ground station. If you guys look on this app right now, you will see this whole website However, the issue is that since our ground station is not on, because there's one part of the <laughs> arm right here, you will not see live data as we want it. Right, another uh, component is the battery transfer pod, which it, its job is to transfer the battery from the VBM to the UAV, or from the UAV to the VBM. And it does this using a five-degree freedom robotic arm called the Open Multicolor X by Robotis. And it has five dynamic vessel server motors, which allow it to extract the battery with ease and to, to and from the UAV and the battery chambers themselves. Now the pod, uh, the, the, the arm also 
lifts the battery up and to up uh, towards the sky, so that the uh, center of mass, the total center of, center of mass, does not move away from the, the four motors that support it. And the four motors can also supply uh, have the power to supply the weight of both the arm, the the pod, and the battery. Uh, the pod also has two ultrasonic sensors in the front, one in the front, one in the back, to help tell it which station it is at. And in total, this allows for the, the system to go to a, a station and extract the battery or put a battery in there within less than two minutes. So you have seen the whole ground system. We have the battery vending machine, the ground control station, and the battery transfer pod. So how do we uh, calculate the values of each power it needs? And we estimate it to be around 538 watts of power. We got this by individually calculating each system adding it together and then multiplying it by 1.5. The reason is we want to have more than enough power to power our system. And our whole ground system, we want it to be located in rural areas such as the desert where we can't just take a uh, wire and plug it into the outlet like we would do in this room or the lab. So we decided to use three 190 watt, watt solar panels which will use the sun as our power source and also a 48 volt LiPo battery that will be charging it charged by the, uh, the solar panels as well as charging the whole system during the night time. So for safety purposes, since this is high voltage and high current, we use DIN rails to protect our system from over voltage, over currents, or um, any short circuits. We also use buck converters to distribute the power from the ground station to the B and the BVM, as well as using wire wireless uh, charging for the battery transfer pod since we don't want to have a lot of wires just running around. So in conclusion, our whole system is created by three really complex parts put together and we minimize a way to turn the battery replacement within five minutes. Again, a LiPo battery takes two to four hours itself to charge up um, completely. So by doing this method, we reduce the flight time by a lot of, you know, a lot, because that's five minutes versus two slash four hours. And the efficiency of our work is that there's a, a lot of autonomous working. So there's not a lot of human interaction, er, therefore less human errors, as well as being an eco-friendly system. You know, everything is being powered up by our solar panels, our LiPo batteries, and we have in mind when building this whole system that is very cost efficient. So everything you see here was made by the students at Cal Poly Pomona in the laboratories. And we would like to acknowledge all our advisors and our sponsors for supporting Banshee and Banshee UAV Robotics. Is there a reason why you decided to go with the rotational design instead of like a grid configuration of the battery packs? Yeah, so the reason why we have it this way before, it was actually, we didn't even use the pod itself. It was just this, and then it would spin, rotate to 90 degrees, and then we would we could have it like a diagonal where it like moves like this. But I feel like it's a lot easier. One, it's like a vending. You know, it's bending our system, as well as it's very compact when it's a circular motion. So um, this is like pretty small. If I had a demo, it would be like from here to like four blocks, not even four, maybe three and a half. So it's very small and very compact because it's just rotating this way or the other way. Okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, who would uh, facilitate and manage the ground control stations? Um, like in the world? Yeah, across the nation. Um, at the moment we are unsure do, because we are still on the prototyping uh, mode. However, I don't, I don't even know. Like maybe we can have our students actually maybe look around, uh, look and manage our system since we are the one that are focused on it. Or even our Air Force Research Laboratory, which really supports us in our work. So they provide us a lot of funding as well as a lot of the materials. So they could also help us with um, managing our systems around the world. Um, my question is, um, I've seen a lot of moving mechanism mm -hmm. in your design. So how often does it need to maintain or how hard is it to maintain the whole system? Uh, the whole system itself at the moment is still in prototyping. As you can see, it 
you can see this station is still fairly wobbly. So we're actually finding ways to secure our pod onto each other. So at the moment, we actually have a bracing right here to keep everything stable. And at the same time, this is not moving when there's no drum. So it's just gonna be stationary. It actually has an induction charging at the end with the pod. So nothing is really moving until a drone lands onto the system. Thank you. Is there a system in place in case of malfunction? Um, that goes along with um, what his question is, which was who can maintain um, our system? So we actually did a way where we can tell the, the system to say, oh, there's an error in, you know, stop, stop the code. And that actually gets sent to our website, which is this page, this page. It, if you scroll down more, um, we actually, I don't know if it's published yet, but we actually had a, a message box that says um, error, you know, someone needs to fix it. But again, no people fixing it right now, it's us in our <laughs> laboratory, so. It looks like your design, a great design, by the way. Uh, it looks like your design is uh, outdoors, exposed to the elements. Yes. Have you anticipated, or what issues have you anticipated with temperature ranges at these various sites, or precipitation, rain, snow, things like that, and how it would affect your system? So we know for sure that you know PLA plastic was not, not going to be effective in these deserts and everything. Like for for us, have used PLA for now, and it caused like our first like an hour of exposure to the sun, and we were exposed to other metals. It started to like kind of work due to the power of the PLA. We do plan on like, using other materials, like uh, I believe we plan to CNC some of these materials as well, like the more exposed uh, parts of the project, so that uh, we can cover a more of the, uh, the more robust. Uh, with the rotational mechanism, do you guys anticipate or have something in place to deal with the fact that you're going to have wires twisting or anything like that? Yeah, so actually that's a really good point because again, first we switched it with a wireless connection, but there's still wires like you said, right? So our, uh, it doesn't say on this rotation, but the battery vending machine actually only rotates halfway and this way. So since we're using a NEMA 23 stepper motor, it's a lot of accuracy on where we rotate. So we wanted to also get rid of the wiring situation uh, before we had it rotate fully and then fully back, which caused a lot of rotational like um, tangling with the cable. So we fixed it by having it only 80 degrees, or not 80, 180 <laughs> degrees, uh, both sides. We might also put slip couple at some point as well for the wires, but that's for a later project. For now, we just want to ground it between the first and the last game, you know, 180, well, 360, 0 and 360, so it doesn't fully rotate and go start to tangle the wires fully. Awesome, good job. Good job, can we just thank our presenters for my time?